please. Thank you. Okay, All right. Let's go. Let's go. All right. So thank you for coming here. Uh, it's a really great pleasure. It's a really great opportunity to be here, to be able to speak for Indela and be able to give away some of the things that I found really challenging, really exciting, and something you don't see um, people providing any solution to. Like, uh, we, we'll go to one of the real controversial topic about what, what Elasticsearch is and uh, what are the catches? Let's start with who I am and why why I am and, and how this whole thing came to be. And then we'll go to feel the uh, this areas where I'm belong, where, where I'm from. And then uh, we will jump right in the the very tricky parts of the elastic search, which you may not be uh, you may not be able to find easily on the Google or even in their official docs. So those are a few things that I will mention and then we'll go to the implementation with one bonus of Docker that I will give away and how it can solve your problems. For those of you who don't use Docker, maybe this is a great chance for you to start using it. And this is, uh, and, and then in the last, I will show the implementation and show a demo real quick. So everyone can relate. So this is going to be like all level. It's going to, uh, it's going to target all kind of audience. You can be any level. You can be expert. You can be beginner. This should be for you, right? So starting from me, who I am, I'm Tala. I'm based in Pakistan, mainly from Faisalabad. It's the third largest city in the Pakistan. I've been developing all my life. Um, even before I got graduated, even before I got in high school, this was something I knew I can do because, uh, um, so the story started like this. I was always curious about how do people do this reverb in their mic? How do this work? So uh, how does echo work? Echo, echo, echo. How does this work? So my mind as a child was full of curiosity and full of uh, questions and I wanted to find and I wanted to solve. So this abstract was the beginning of this journey. And, and in my mind, I was thinking maybe you can start a thread and then a little bit after you can raise a tiny thread and, and maybe lower the volume. And then a little bit after you can do this again. And this is how you can do a reverb. So as a child, I was building a logic in my mind. And to my surprise, I used something called NeuroWay with Dieter like two years after from my own fun and just exploration. And this, to my surprise, I found the same logic implemented in, in, in production app. This is where I knew that I had it in me. And, and if I chose this, choose this part, choose this path, this is going to be a really fun adventure because I'm made for it. Recently, I've been working with the Lighthouse. It's something like a Airbnb subsidiary or, or, or a same kind of model where you cash, give rent away, give rewards on, on successful uh, onboarding of a customer of a, of a lead. So I've been managing and, and holding like uh, the whole throne uh, as a founding member and, and leading any of the team that was coming and joining and getting onboarded. Moving on, where I'm from, I'm from Faisalabad, Pakistan. It's a uh, two, uh, let's go to the funny part. Definitely not a desert, definitely not. It's something that movies would tell you about. Like if any of you watch the series, The Arrow, you will know there, there is a mention of Nanda Parbat or, or where Oliver goes and, and uh, everything is like, stony mountains and desert and sand but it's not it if you watch breaking bad you know the mexico is all red always in in yellow light it's not it so yeah breaking the stereotypes it's really a fun place you can get a lot of things like you can have your own private jets you can have paintball fights you can have a lot of things like even the ghost town the artificial one i'm just gonna minimize this thing so you can see. So yeah, that's the watchtower, the, the really great pride of Faisalabad, the, the main landmark. So what does Pakistan do? It's a really big 
import and export in all Asia. About 48% of the export and import is done here, but not to go in that detail, we are technical people. Let's go back and do nerdy stuff. <laughs> all right. So definition, now the main topic, elastic search. What, what it is and why are people so confused about it and why some people never use it. Uh, to some, it's a NoSQL, to some, it's a dual scene doc, to some, it's a full flash DB, but to some, it's a search engine. So, which is it? And can you use it for all purpose? And if so, how? So, let's break it down and let's see uh, what we can do and, and how we can use it. So, to provide a really no brainer definition, what Elasticsearch is, it's a, it's a hybrid. So, you can use it as a search engine because it, it have a sharding, it, it can uh, make some of your searches indexed and cached, and it, it, is, it calls it hot, hot, hot cached or hot indexes, and the things that does not get access at all, it calls it cold indexes. So this is how Elasticsearch prioritize what is being searched, and, and this is how it maintain its speed. So it's really easy. It's a really like an out of the box experience. If you want to build your search, then it's a good thing. But if you want to do anything other than search, like maybe have a DB in it or maybe have some definition in it. So it can be, it can get a little bit tricky. And, and the reason it can get a little bit tricky is because there are no traditional tools like migration, the ORM, uh, the uh these schemas and and you will never find like a language specific detail like for example you want to do maybe you are a node.js developer and you want to find a node.js uh api or or docs but there will be some but it will never cover all the things and all the edge cases so you will have to fall back to the wrappers or, or the API wrappers that you may end up using uh, third party packages and the, or, or maybe just create your own. Now to get too deep, it's a, it's a one of the catch when you use Elasticsearch. It can be good thing and a bad thing. Good thing, you are in full control. You, you get all the ingredients and you can decide what kind of recipe you want. And the bad thing, maybe this is not your kind of role maybe this is not your kind of platform maybe you want a bulky uh, db which can give and offer everything uh, out of the box so yeah let's talk about that so apache lucene it's a it's a elastic search is built on apache lucene lucene is something that we call uh, uh, like uh, like in Mongo or in NoSQL, you will call your DB record as an doc, not as a row. In in relational database, in Postgres, in MySQL, you will call it as a row, but here you will not call it as a row. You will call it as Lucene doc. So yeah, Lucene doc is is a, a term that you use when you define a row in your DB. DB here is called in dice. So a lot of the terminology is, but I'm going to keep it simple and, and, and I'm just going to call it do, uh, row and, and table to not confuse you. So what are Lucene doc and what are the, the, the very tiny, tiny problem and very complex problem that you may end up facing yourself and you may not know what to do and how to even begin searching a solution for this. So your employer can say, hey, we have eight submissions, we have eight records in our database. Can you do a count on them? Or, or, or just wondering, can you do a count on them? When you do a count on it, you are gonna get a really false positive number, which could be eight, which could be 16, depending on how many nested levels you have. So this is one of the edge cases of Elasticsearch no one talks about and isn't really, uh, in the headers of warning headers. So here I am telling you one of my experience and, and problem that I faced it was this. So 
uh, I was made to ingest about 6,232 properties or rows or column, whichever you want to call it. When I wanted to go back and see some of the analytics, some of the, the statistics on it, I, I found there was like 288,000 uh, counts on it. To my surprise, I didn't expect that. Maybe I end up running the script too many times. But then the, the catch was the moral of that story. The learning point was that if you want to use Elasticsearch, never, never use it as a nested uh, holder of, of your information. Maybe you have an information about a visitor log. Uh, the visitor is coming to various pages. It's going to about us. It's going to index pages or whichever the pages you want to keep that track, you want to keep that analytics. So what you should do if you want to do, if you want to use Elasticsearch, you should compress that data into flat object. So in here you will see prices. We have nested object, but in this side you have a flat object. So Elasticsearch should be used as a reference DB, as a secondary DB, uh, instead of like a full-fledged DB where you keep each and everything inside of it. So that's really a bad way to do it unless you know what you're doing. So if you if you came across this problem, the, the solution to it is just flatten your index. Now the migration problem, why do I, why do I mention migration problem in my first slide and, and what does it mean? So Imagine that you have something called pets. You end up adding cats and dogs and tons of other animals. And, and along with that, you added prices, but you, you did a mistake and you add the price as a string. And now you want to do some operations on it, some numerical operations on it. Maybe you want to say, hey, give me pet where you have price more than $20 or give me pad where you have price less than $10. So Elasticsearch will not help you there because you are trying to implement or add a clause which only works on a numeric value. So there are two kinds of migrations or typing that Elasticsearch does. One is called dynamic uh, mapping. So the first time you did price with a string 10, it made it fix it, 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 it recorded that price as a string and never to be changed again. Maybe you have 10 million, 20 million record and it cannot be changed anymore. And if you want to change it, you may end up using very complex script, which may take the same amount of time to download the whole thing, do a offline transformation and upload it and delete your whole DB. It's, it's a, this much disaster. So this is why I feel like migration problem is one of the biggest thing uh, people run into when they use Elasticsearch without knowing what they are getting into. So what is the solution to that? The solution to that is you should use a mapping and you should think ahead what kind of uh, in columns you're gonna add and, and think ahead what kind of possible integers type the data type they're going to get. So do not change your data types after you have very large DB. Try to minimize that. And if you must do that, maybe try to add a new column, but not update the existing one. Because if you update the existing one, you may as well just drop and make a new DB. It's going to be that tough. Here, I put one API example, how you can do mapping. Of course, I'm gonna go in the code and show you the, the better version of it, but this is what Elasticsearch will give you in the doc. Now, special guest is our geospatial. This is a very fun topic and maybe one of the biggest reason if anyone would use Elasticsearch, this, this is the first thing to come to the mind when you want to do something on the map. What is geospatial? What is map? Is simply street data, building data, and your landmarks attached to coordinate, coordinates. And what can you do with it is that 
imagine that you have an app like Food Panda or something, and and uh, you are in Dallas, you are in New York, and and you are trying to find restaurant inside of it, and what the system should do, how the system should act, is give you the the pointers around your location or or on the visible location, maybe on your phone screen, you are only saying like two, three streets, not more than three streets. The system should only give you markers on those three streets and not the whole city or not the whole country because that is gonna use a lot bandwidth and that's gonna uh, kill the whole app. Maybe crash it because it's gonna run a very big, big query and maybe it's gonna return too much record that a user doesn't even want to see maybe user wants to see the new york only he doesn't want to go all the way to las vegas to find a burger right so yeah let's see how we can implement this and uh this is uh we will come back to my bonus on the docker let's go to how we how you can do elastic search so i use some i use a docker how do i hide this thing Hide, hide, hide. All right. So mapping. This is how you can use a mapping. In my previous slide, you notice that the, the properties is your parent level where you define all the, the clauses or all the columns. So this is just a single singular name. And if you want to define something nested, you add a property again and then it becomes nested. All of this format is based on what Elasticsearch have in their own mapping and 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 reserve keywords so you should refer to the doc how you can add a certain type for example i want to do just the type string i don't really need to add all of this i will just do a type text and it's gonna do just that so what i did and how i minimized my elastic search problem was to create a mapping i know that my uh coordinates are going to have two points it's going to have a latitude it's going to have a longitude and it's going to have like these many uh characters not more than that so i did this as an initial and first step because if ever there is a problem with my data with my seed i want the system to throw an error instead of changing dynamic type or or keeping that faulty value maybe i have maybe i have a let, latitude or longitude which is more than let's say 300 400 words uh, characters that is a wrong wrong coordinate because the coordinate can only go about 14 or 16 max so this is how you can do mapping and and just to give you a tiny idea of how you can do a seed as well maybe you want to push to a server through SSH or something, and you want to install these uh, dependencies, but you don't really have access to it to, to run the script. So this is where your Docker can help you run this through NPM, and, and I can show you how you can do this later. So this is just my uh, simple script, which I'm using to uh, check if my indice exists. If yes, then okay. If not, then delete it. And, and after deleting, create that again, uh, put a mapping and then put the seed. Simple as that. Now to go to control of mind, just to give a little bit of uh, context, these are way too many files. I'm just hiding them. So don't get confused. How can one file work the whole system? So let's see, this is my express function and inside my express function I'm sending top left and bottom right coordinates, uh, south, west or northeast, you can call it. And I'm just calling it inside my function. This function is using a reserve keyword in Mongo, you call it something like op gd greater than equal or op eq as a equal. In here you can call it uh, geo bonding box in in mongo you call it something like uh i think b box or map box so yeah you i provided the top right and bottom left and then the only thing i did was uh use the wrapper and make a search to the, the restful apis because behind this there is a restful api it's not a language specific platform so you may end up using a lot of the wrappers 
or a lot of the third party APIs to uh, packages to accomplish your goal. And in the end, I'm just transforming that and returning the, the markers. Let's see how that works. In here, I have rendered a map. On this map, I have a few markers. So notice that uh, maybe I should open uh, dev tool so you can see it's not rendering more than what I have on my map uh, map bound. So what is map bound? Map bound is the visible view port of your device. So if I have like a mobile device, and this is going to be like 320 pixels or 480 pixels is the, the max width of a mobile. So that's going to be your width in viewport. And that is what Elasticsearch is going to use to uh, show. Let's see in developer tool, I'm just going to go to network tab to see how many markers I, I am rendering. And if my script is running the way it is supposed to run, it should not give me bunch of markers it should only give me the marker that i have visibility on the map so right now let's do a little bit shake and see how many I, am i getting so i'm getting about 10 let's go zoom in let's see how much so now i'm getting only one which is what it's it's supposed to do um if i go a little bit up i'm hoping to get two or three there you go and now i'm getting three so this is how you can make your own um, map app and, and use Elasticsearch to it. And now going back to this, what is Docker and why do I call Docker a magic? Those of you who use Docker knows the magic of it. Those who don't, let me explain why. Uh, in old time, when I say old time, I mean era of Windows XP or 7. Uh, we used to have something called a VM machines, VM boxes, because there were certain types like EXE, DMG, DEB, things like that we wouldn't run on, on our own OS or was not able to run it. So we had to take these uh, support from other OS. But Docker solved that problem using uh, your own PC, your own kernels, and only downloading the, the certain dependency to run all the kind of extensions and, and make it easier for you to deploy uh, without making the whole replica by just changing the ENV. We'll go there. Let me just uh, wrap this up uh, real quick. So what can Docker do? It can install your dependencies for you. Those dependencies can be native client. Maybe you want to install Postgres. And Postgres includes two things. It, it can include PGCLI, maybe the native, or maybe the native executable for your OS. And it, it can include PG and NPM package, which is only a language specific package. So it can do both of these things and it can link them. So you don't have to do any extra effort when you are deploying your app or, or you are just using the portable functions of it. Uh, maybe you don't have access to the server and you want to install this PG. Maybe you want to install the Elasticsearch and, and you, you don't just have that access. So you can put a Docker and push this image and any service that support this image can run this command and, and install it all for you. How am, how am I using Docker here? I'm using Docker to install all of the set dependency, which I just explained. And then I'm using Docker to run my initial scripts. Initial scripts like mapping, like seeding. So those are my custom scripts and there can be tons and tons of them, like maybe some microservices uh, that people are using a very complex kind of logic. So those kind of thing you can also put in Docker and, and let Docker handle that for you. And last thing is deploying servers. So um, one of the big thing when you work in, in server side, in, in DevOps is a CI CD. It's a very normal term that you, you want to push out whatever the changes you have and you want to release it for the user to test. But you don't really do the whole release thing just like that. You want to test it, you want to stage it. Maybe you want to have some QA on it. Maybe there are some QA people or your director or your, your operation manager wants to have a view on the UI. Maybe your marketing team 
need to see what kind of things you have written. Maybe there are typos. So how do people counter that is by using environments like staging, production, and development. And this is how they, they create a barrier uh, of no bug zone on the production. And this can be easily done in Docker by providing the ENV. Uh, let's go here and let's see how I did it and how you can to do it. So services is your first thing when you want to install a native app and, and you can install that by using some image. Um, here you can find the image, you can simply do a search on, on uh, the Docker Hub for an image. Maybe you want to install a Chrome, maybe you want to install Postgres, so you just need to put it here. And if there is any environment that this app works on, you can provide it. Maybe you are using Puppeteer, which is like headless Chrome, and, and you want a single thread, a single process without any animation. So you can provide an environment here, and you can also limit uh, the how many RAM it wants to use. But mine, all of these things are part of your original program. It's not docker specific so for puppeteer or some other thing you may end up using something called um like maybe ram one two three equals something right so this is just to give you an example if there is such a program that accept flag attributes you you have full with full control on doing that will not go into you limits it's a uh, simply some ram thing but you you may be able to do a simple uh, search on it. So we just allocated a volume, which is an important thing. And then we define how we want to use this volume. We also ca can't go in super detail how these volumes and stuff work. Uh, let's focus on the port and, and things that we normally do. All of the other stuff is uh, really deep, low level stuff, which you may never need to encounter. Port. Uh, one port, one program can expose some ports. Maybe you install the MySQL, maybe you install um, uh, PM2. So the ports need to broadcast. So th there can be some port like 88, and maybe th this is your incoming. You can you have full control on changing your outgoing port, and this is how you can do it. Now let's talk about what I say about environments and what I say about your dependency installation is all defined inside the docker file this is your main champ when it comes to packaging the whole docker so you you just define how you want to uh, what kind of platform you want to uh, make this image of so here i'm using node so i would choose this whole image to be in node flavor and then i'm just copying the, copying this thing inside an image and then i'm running some setup. So if I go to my package.json, uh, yep, hidden file. So it, it has something called uh, npm run setup, which is running this setup.sh. So whenever my Docker is deployed, uh, after it whole copy and after the whole image, it's going to do a setup of my Elasticsearch because Elasticsearch needs to be live with data before it can do anything before we start the, the server. So here I have the ENV. You can have a lot of ENVs and you can also have a variable ENV. So this ENV can dictate how your app performs. For example, I can say uh, map color to be red. So maybe in my staging, I want it to be red. Maybe in production, I want it to be white. So things like that, you can dictate and you don't really have to spawn a different servers or spawn a different repository for each of them. And that's really uh, tiny in a nutshell, how Docker helps you uh, do your stuff. So yep, that's uh, pretty much it. If you have any questions, do let me know. I, I'm going to stop sharing. Um. That was such a great presentation. Thank you so much, Tala. I'm sure we all learned a lot. Um, you all know my technical ignorance, so I 
I learned a lot, but I didn't understand a whole lot of it. But it was it was really great presentation. Thank you so much. And um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to throw them into the chat for for Tala. Hi, hi, Dipin is here. Hi, Dipin, feel free. The floor is yours. Yes, yes. So yes, it's the nice uh, uh, seminar. Uh, but I have one question and query. So in the elastic search, uh, elastic search, we are mostly we have big data. Then we are using the shared and replicas, right? So in this elastic search document, they have not proper calculation how to use the how many shared and replicas. So I am expecting something formula or something good way to calculate those things. Mm, I think the, the thing you want to ask is sharding. So what sharding is, is, is a relay server in your relational database. It's called a master and a slave server. What does yes. that mean is, uh, yeah. yep. Yes. So it's totally possible to do that. It, uh, to, to those of you who don't know what this is, I will just explain in one line. So what, what is master slave? server so uh imagine google having a lot of searches and and in pakistan so you're doing a lot of searches it doesn't really go all the way to united states or europe wherever the main server is it goes to child server it goes to sleep server where your data is stored and then uh, gradually pushed out to the master this way you have some nodes that is only dedicated on reading and some nodes who are only dedicating on writing so your one server is writing all the things that user are saying and the other server is busy serving them this way you end up load balancing and 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 keeping really relative search and and friendly environment for your whole build you don't want to exhaust your resource so Elasticsearch uses something called sharding you can say hey i want these many shards and hey i want this shard to be connected yes to yes server. so that is the yes so that is the my question how how i can select i need three shard four shard how i can say i need that much number of replicas so that's currently it's uh, something like trial and error we need to do. So is there any proper way to decide uh, how we can choose that particular number, number of SAD and number of replicas? That is yep. the, my question. Yep. So there is something called Elasticsearch.yml or it can be CONF config file. These files usually sit on your server and your server dictates how you access them. If you talk about AWS, they don't really give you that access so you end up using the rest client to update the settings but if you have access to the whole os on the root level and you can change your elastic search or yml that hold the whole information how many shard and how the shards are performing so you may want to look into that no 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 still still you not get my question i can able to change that there is not any issue but what efficient value I need to set? For example, I have 1 billion data, right? I have one master and let's assume three slave, okay? So I don't know which is the good value. For example, some, someone is setting the number of SAD 10, someone is setting the number of SAD 4, right? Someone is saying the replica number of five, replicas number of seven. So what is the good way or calculation to those number of the sad and replicas that is the my question got it got it so you want to know uh, or dictate you want to dictate who can access which shard so that you no, can do no no still 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 you're not getting the point okay, okay. uh all right uh okay Let's repeat it. it Maybe try rephrasing it into dumb it down for me. <laughs> okay. okay. Or, or, or this is also Please a continue. conversation. We will discuss later on that. 
Yep, I think uh, the bottom line is it's it's something it's possible and you, uh, there are two ways you dictate them. One is your YML and one is your code level. So in code level, you actually have an attribute that says shard or that says locale. So you can say locale equals shard one, shard two, shard three. So this is how you can dictate who gets to serve by who, but mind that Elasticsearch uses the shard internally to uh, do some indexes like like I explained, there are some hot indexes, there are some cold indexes. So you may want to give Elasticsearch uh, more than one shard and not really limit that, but you, you can al always spend some child process if you want to uh, have a different servers that are doing specific jobs. And Tala, I think, how do you decide on the number of shards? Yep, it's in, in the your configuration. You can do in your configuration and you can provide how many instance you want to do. Great. Um, yeah, so I, in that, so that is the, my question. In that, what I will provide that particular number. That's what I'm saying. I know that I need to change in the YML file, right? But I am saying which number I need to set. For example, I can set two, three, four, five, six, any number. But I want that perfect number. Well, it's a it's really a code specific talk. Maybe we can follow up on it, and you can share me what you have, and I can help. It's really hard to tell what you have in your system and make a prediction on it. So let's follow up on it to to give other people chance to ask a question. I think this would be a great conversation to pick up in a skills channel for other people to, to chime in on. Tala, maybe you can nominate which would be the best skills channel if there isn't one set up. Um, I can set up an AMA for after this or we can have a chat on the chatter channel. Um, so let's definitely pick this up afterwards. Do you want to dive into one of the other questions? Sure. Uh, Ahmed asked, um, are there any good resources to study? advanced elk topics uh if you are asking me about elastic search then elastic search itself if you're asking me about uh in general then there are a lot of sites like maybe brilliant and uh, elk expert kind of thing so yeah let me know what what is your what kind of skills you are trying to learn And there's another question there. Oh, uh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry for interrupting, but um, not at I'm, all. I'm just I'm I'm talking to from like uh, beginner level to the advanced level of ELK. I found it really hard to find a good tutorials on YouTube or even in maybe Udemy or Udacity. But if this website doesn't provide this um, good quality content, you just open, let's say, uh, assemble assemble application to do um, maybe. Um, a simple website or simple logic that we provide uh, like now in our uh, demo. And thanks, by the way, for your uh, demo today. Uh, but I'm talking about, let's say, um, advanced level. By advanced level, I'm talking about, um, let's say, a company that push like seven teraflops per day, and they need to do analytics, um, how we can aggregate, how we can maintain the setup. Um, all of these resources, I find it really hard. Uh, to to find an answers for it. So if you are have a good resource for it, um, maybe a good website, a good reference that you go for when you get stuck in some particular ALK scenarios. Yep. So it's it's a really common problem that we face, and that is finding almost like whole A to Z kind of tutorial or kind of course. So how I how I uh, fix that for myself. I don't know, maybe other people have some creative solutions. So how I do that for myself is have subscribed to the change log, number one. Number two, uh, have a node open and see the multiple tutorials. For example, there is one guy who's talking about sharding. So you just write down chart. There is another guy who so talking about Docker. So you type Docker. So this way you will 
watch few of them, maybe try a little bit to expedite and just keep noting those topics, those uh, pointers. Once you have the pointers and when you feel like that, no one is talking anything new, then start searching on them individually. Then you're gonna get almost all of the details. Maybe people are really going on a high level and not going down the specific on how you can do sharding. But if you only search about sharding, you are gonna get few more of those words. Uh, how, how do you spawn the instances? And then you, you search spawn instance, then you are gonna get a little bit more. So it really depends on you how much deeper you wanna go. But I think this is the way for me it is that that I just uh, try to see multiple talks and multiple resources and, and do my own research. And one of the thing I do and really helpful thing is a change log. So if, if a language or if a feature is saying, hey, we just released version 1.2 before we had this, 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 now we had this, 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 maybe you should just subscribe to the newsletter and see what are the changes and how did they uh, do it. So as, a, as developers who use third party, this is a common practice to, to subscribe to Chainlog. Maybe you are using Next.js or React.js. So there, there can be something like a React portal, which I'm sure not many people have used or heard of. But if you subscribe to it, then you will notice that things like those can come really handy. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I have one more question, but if you don't have time or um, uh, we can discuss it later, maybe in the Slack or something like this. Um, between e Elastic or uh, Open Test through the AWS solution, uh, if I'm preparing uh, to uh, maybe introduce the Elastic setup in my company, and let's say it's a mid-sized company, it's not like uh, having this hard log or uh, I need this much of a support and what what what's what's your recommendation to go for elastic or going for uh open desk uh regarding of course the elastic uh, i'm talking about not the free version but uh, uh the supported one so what's your recommendation uh, based on mid-sized companies not startup not enterprise um which solution to go for yep so for startups for mid i would avoid using aws people it's it's just my opinion though it's uh there, there's a freedom on scalability that uh you only pay how much you use but there is also a catch and that is if people try to ddos you deny service attack if people try to uh use our application many times open it hundred thousand times then you're going to get built more. There are a lot of things like Cloudflare to prevent those, but really it's going to just add up more bills. So if you are asking about a medium, small size business, I would go for direct Elasticsearch, the, the supported version, and that have the a lot more official packages that you can use and you can relate more on their documentation. If you use OpenSearch, that AWS is giving you, then you will be conflicted with uh, the real documentation versus the AWS one because both of them inherit something from each other. And sometimes you just need to jump from here and there. So it really doesn't give any benefit to use AWS at this point, unless you know that you, there, is some, uh, there is some certain thing only AWS can do, then go for it. Otherwise, if you are looking for Elasticsearch, then start from the official elastic.co or maybe like Algolia or Bonsai. Those are really great uh, platform to start. I would recommend Bonsai. Yeah, thanks so much for your support and um, thanks so much for all your effort today. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I think there's one last question in the chat there from, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, Dami Lola. Do you want to come off mute and ask the question yourself or Tala, maybe you can scroll up and find that question there. I think that's the last one. Uh, I have a question. Uh, oh, great. Uh, at Xiaomi, uh, if, if somebody from QA field to want to change uh, their field, and they want to jump into the front end development or software development. How, how, how would 
the transition? Got it. Really general question, uh, but I would love to answer because I see a lot of my friends struggling to choose their field. What I would suggest is you to touch a lot of fields. So by touching, I don't really mean committing to them. I mean just going through them. Uh, how I chose to be a, a full stack JS right now is that I started with C, C++, VB, Java, all of these stuff. And then I found that JavaScript is love. So here I am. What you can do is maybe try to find your motivation. What is your, what is it? But also do know the scope of that thing. Don't go learn WordPress. No offense to people who use WordPress, but uh, it's something that is not in demand. So if you want to do something, maybe try something trendy and try a lot of it and then see which one is your flavor to pick on. No, uh, okay, uh, thank you for answering the question uh, the one way, but I want to put in, uh, in an, another way that, okay, I'm learning React.js and, and really enjoying it, a JavaScript stuff. I've been doing automation as well, but how, how can I transition uh, or, or get a job as a developer, uh, front-end developer from QA engineer? Yep, so the transition is in, it, it really depends on your position. Like uh, for example, myself, uh, I, let's say I'm a QA person. So what I would do, uh, I would go to uh, these code talk. I would join these uh, uh, webinars or build up my skills and maybe earn some certificates or do some tests. So when I know that I have some certain skill and, and I know that I can do that, what I would do is start from, maybe reach out through networking and start that position, maybe from a bigger level. And because you don't really have history on that role, so it's it's quite common to, to be at a bigger level at first. So you would go like a junior React engineer, and then after uh, spending some months or maybe a year, uh, people start noticing you that you do have a skill. And yeah, this is how I think you can transition. There is no real way to say that, hey, I just learned this skill and now I demand the world to give me this job. It doesn't really work like that. So maybe you have the skill, but you still, you need to do a lot of networking and you need to start, you need to take baby steps. Baby step is a must. Thank you. Great advice there, Tala, particularly about knowing what skills are most in demand and taking baby steps. And um, if anyone does have any questions about skills that are in demand, the matchers at Indela are always um, only too keen to let you know what skills are most in demand among our clients and they can guide you towards what, where to study, what new skills to pick up. And we all know React is really popular among our clients at the moment. So it's a really good example that you used. We have time for one last question. I see Dami Lola. I hope I pronounced your name right. You've come okay. off mute. You had a question. And um, we'll give yes. you the last one. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, actually, I work with uh, uh, maps. I do JavaScript. And I've had a challenge in the past. Uh, I have a lot of data on the database, precisely uh, SQL Server. Of course, um, sometimes I do have those data also on Postgres. And the issue is this, when you are loading uh, hundreds of thousands of data, the map, you know, I mean, the map gets, um, you know, just crash because the data is too much. So I feel Elasticsearch is the way to go, but I don't really get how I can connect the Elasticsearch to special database like Postgres SQL. Um, um, for example, you know, Postgres SQL, you can store those latitude and longitude inside it, or we store it, uh, you know, the special data format standard. How can I connect Elasticsearch to uh, a database like Postgres SQL? Mm, really nice question. Uh, I did face something similar, and uh, yeah, the the answer is really 
creative. So what you can use is SQLize. SQLize is a package and ORM package that sit on top of Postgres. It's just like Mongoose for Mongo, but it's SQLize for uh, Postgres SQL. So what you can do is use SQLize, then define a model, then define a hook. So inside your hook, you can say before update, after update, after create, after delete. So these four or five hooks you do have. So inside those hooks, you can do a sync. So you can say, hey, uh, this ID just changed the name to <clears throat> ABC to XYZ. So in Postgres is going to change that first, and then it's going to say, I'm done, give it to hook. Hook is going to search for any of the callbacks. It will find Elasticsearch, and then it will say, hey, Elasticsearch, I just updated this thing. I think you should update that as well. So Elasticsearch will update it. But how you should connect them versus how you should use them are two different things. So be very, very uh, focused on not using your elastic search for a full fledged uh, data extract. If you have, let's say, 10, 20 columns in your Postgres, you should not export all of them into elastic search. Only put the data, let's say, name, address, city, state, coordinates, and ID. So okay. things like that should sit in elastic search. Anything else other than, let's say, uh, avatars, pictures, media, rents parking so all of those things should stay in the postgres and how you can use them is by using pdp page uh, sorry product detail page so maybe you have um, a search page a map page where you are showing a marker Mar markers are showing name and uh, price when you click on it you can go to the, the detail page and that detail Absolutely page much, can yeah. be searched from postgres so that's okay. how you can use both of those dbs and connect them but you you need to use a workaround and that is to be really really mindful on how the elastic search can get tricky if you put nested data inside of it or too much data inside of it always compress your data and always try to use a flat level object you don't want to use a nested object there okay thank you very much just one more uh, before i go Oh, okay, we've mentioned uh, point data, that's latitude and longitude. You know, sometimes we also work with polygons and the line data. So how do we also handle that? Some of those polygons are stored inside uh, Postgres SQL. How do we handle that also? Yep, so both Elasticsearch and Postgres support polygons. So you, you may want to look into uh, those functions, those reserved keywords they have. Uh, I can go in detail, but it can get really lengthy. So what, I'm, what I will suggest you is to just have a look at map bounds and, and okay. right there, you will see uh, such map bounds, which accepts more than four parameters. So parameters can, can be more than just top right bottom left it can be 20 30 so there is a limit but you will you will see it and uh, that should help you perform this action and uh, coming back to Etisham, uh, there is one thing that i wanted to mention and really thanks to indela and for all of us to be here and and really uh, it's it's a luck that we are here and we are attached to Indela. I think there isn't any greater opportunity. If you want to change your field, Indela is your way to go. Why do I feel like that? Because traditional jobs, you, you will have to prove yourself and you will have to run office to office and you can say, hey, you can take a test. And I really am saying I'm, I'm, I'm expert in this. You, you should really hire me. So traditional offices are hard, it's, uh, it's COVID time, so it doesn't really give you much out of your effort. But with Indela, I think this is something you can prove and I think don't even need proving. So if there is any such chance, let's say Nicola is posting a job at IBM that uses React and you have already invested 
four or five months into building your skills, I don't think you need to tell Nicola that you have skills. You can just apply there. IBM will, will uh, interview you. If you pass, then you're in. It's simple as that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Tala. That's a lovely, very positive note to end our first Elasticsearch um, technical workshop on. I want to thank you on behalf of everyone who joined this presentation, on behalf of the community team at Endela. We really appreciate you volunteering your time to, to share your skills with the rest of the community. Um, I'm sure everyone's really grateful as well. Um, what would be the best Slack channel for us to pick up this conversation? Would it be the JavaScript channel or where would you recommend and we continue talking about these questions? Um, a lot of general uh, questions, mm -hmm. not necessarily around Elastics. So maybe the, if there is a skill channel, we can just use that and take it from there. If it get lengthy and it's about JS, we can go to JS. If, it's, okay. uh, if it doesn't get lengthy, then we can stay at it. Great. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, everyone who joined us. I really appreciate it. We'll see you, maybe see you tomorrow. We have a Wellness Wednesday session. If anyone wants to do some, some gentle yoga and meditation, um, that's tomorrow. And then next week, we have Community Town Hall with some very exciting um, content. We have um, a lot of information on the newest clients and partners that Indela's um, partnered with in Q1. There are some big brands and big names there that you're going to want to know about who we've recently partnered with. So you can see what sort of opportunities are going to be coming down the line. I'm very excited about it. I assure you, you're going to be excited about it. We're also going to have um, one of our product managers is going to give an overview of the new self-service um, platform on the Indela site, um, which is also really cool. Loads more exciting updates coming up next week at Town Hall. So I hope I'll see you all there. Um, and I'll leave you there. Enjoy the rest of your mornings or afternoons or evenings. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.